25 years. It's pretty wild to think about, and in that time, there's been tons of extremes. No rules to a rule for nearly every situation, no regulation at all, to USADA and 5am random drug tests. In that amount of time, champions have been born, legends have been made, and it all started that night in Denver, Colorado, November 12th, 1993. With such a big stage and scale, the idea was pretty much unprecedented at the time, and its popularity caused a worldwide surge. The concept was fairly simple. Put all the best martial arts together and have the best disciplines face off to see whose art would come out on top. And no one would have guessed the smaller, unassuming guy in the gi would beat out his much bigger opponents. Naturally, the early UFC events didn't go off without a hitch though, and some pretty strange things happened. I've made a part one to this listed at the end of the video as well if you'd like to see more of this afterwards. I'm Jason from MMA on Point, and these are 10 more unbelievable facts about early UFCs. Number 10, Big John McCarthy. If you followed MMA for any amount of time at all, Big John McCarthy is one of the most familiar faces you'll see. Some new fans may only know him for his color commentary in Bellator, as that's his most recent role in the sport, but he's a seminal figure throughout its history. He became a fixture starting as early as UFC 2 in 1994 and became just as heavily associated with MMA in North America and the UFC as Bruce Buffer, Jeff Blatnick, and Mike Goldberg. He was the MMA or no holds barred referee as it was called back then. 25 years ago, he was an LA cop learning Gracie Jiu Jitsu at the Gracie Academy before the world even knew anything about it. And sure enough, he was interested in way more than just learning it as a hobby. At UFC 1, his size and strength were used to help train Hoist Gracie leading up to the event because he was that much smaller than the original combatants. By UFC 2, however, Big John was ready to enter the competition himself. After all, he was 6'3", 260 pounds, with real technique and jujitsu behind him. It made a ton of sense. But sure enough, it wasn't meant to be. Hoist Gracie was entering the tournament once again, and Horion Gracie, one of the original founders of the UFC and the man to ultimately choose Hoist Gracie to enter the original tournaments, didn't want multiple representatives of jujitsu competing in the tournament against each other. In fact, that was the whole point of it for him in the beginning, is that the Gracie family had the best martial art out there. So as a result, Big John never ended up fighting and found his true calling as one of the best referees of all time, if not the best. On that date in March of 1994, history was made. Number 9. Strange Combatants if you saw the first video I made about this subject last year, you might remember me mentioning a couple of really strange characters. There are restaurant owners and porn tycoons. The list really just goes on. Well, I think that's worth expanding on. Let's start with the restaurant owner, Andy Anderson. He owned a restaurant in Texas that was a totally nude steakhouse. And it was popular. So popular, in fact, that the city of Longview perceived it to be such a moral issue that they literally shut it down. Businesses of its kind became so prevalent in the area that they even had a nickname for them. Downtown SOBs. Son of a bitch! As in sexually oriented businesses. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. And it was called the Chicken Ranch. And supposedly he got onto UFC 5 by supplying ring girls from his nude steakhouse. This is interesting for sure, but the plot thickens when you dive deeper and learn that he was a member of the Aryan Brotherhood and landed himself 20 years in jail for making and distributing the number one party drug for young singles in the area, meth. Also money laundering. He fought just once at UFC 5 and got bulldozed by John Hess just a minute and 30 seconds into the fight. The other guy, Freak Hammaker. Why they spelled it that way is totally baffling to me, but it's all fair game for the old days, I guess. His real name was just Frank. So I guess they just didn't think his name was menacing enough as is. He owned a porn theater as well. Unlike Andy Anderson though, he actually had a legitimate background in Sambo. With this being UFC 2, this actually makes him the earliest competitor in the UFC to represent Sambo. It's the Russian combat sport Habib Nurmagomedov and Fedor Emelianenko have made famous around the world. Despite dominating his fight and getting the submission, Freak injured his arm in the fight and did not continue on in the tournament. This was Hamaker's only fight. He was memorably replaced with an alternate by the name of Fred Edish, who suffered one of the worst beatings in MMA history against Johnny Rhodes. Number 8. Playboy Magazine Pretty insane to think that if it wasn't for a good old fashioned nudie mag, the UFC and MMA as we know it may not exist today, at least here in the West. Believe it or not though, it's not just about featuring celebs, odd pro wrestlers, and octagon girls. 
but they actually have some interesting articles if you are apparently looking there of all places for some strange reason. And this all originated out of the Gracie Challenge when the family ventured into America to tell the world of their highly developed and practical martial art, which favored grappling over the typical karate or taekwondo classes that dominated what people thought of martial arts at the time. This drew attention from a columnist within Playboy by the name of Pat Jordan. And according to Art Davey, the man who is pretty much responsible for putting all of this together and making all this happen, and would become the matchmaker for early UFCs, said he wasn't actually reading Playboy himself, but his secretary clipped the articles for him. I mean, sure, yeah, she just happened to be looking at Playboy articles for quality content, where everyone else is looking. Whatever, but the article she supposedly found while doing this was simply titled Bad, and detailed exactly what Horian Gracie was doing bringing his family's martial art to the US, and taking on all comers in these gyms through the Gracie Challenge, where he was actually offering $100,000 to anybody who could beat him, or any of the other Gracies with their discipline. And just like that, Davey was inspired to meet Horian Gracie at his gym, which he promptly did, and that's where his concept of the Gracie Challenge and these tapes were adapted to a tournament format pitting the best practitioners they could from various disciplines all around the world in a one-night tournament. After being turned down by virtually every TV network from HBO to Showtime, Art Davey eventually came across Semaphore Entertainment Group, a company that specialized in pay-per-view television and taking risks on new potential events to bring to the pay-per-view medium. Campbell McLaren was the man to pick up the phone, and that's how things began. Number 7, the Pride 1 Switcheroo. If you're a big fan of Pride, you undoubtedly remember the first event, and one of their featured bouts was between the ever-popular Dan Severn and Kimo Leopoldo. Unfortunately, the fight ended up being a total dud and a rather boring co-main event ending in a draw just before Hicks and Gracie made history beating Japanese pro wrestler Nobuhiko Takada. The strange thing though is that Dan Severn wasn't supposed to be part of the event at all. He was scheduled to take part in UFC 15 to challenge the man who just shocked the world and beat the previously invincible looking Mark Coleman one event earlier at UFC 14, Marie Smith. Instead though, Smith ended up fighting Tank Abbott, whose record was an abysmal six wins and five losses. In fact, he was coming off of two losses just before this, one to a very young Vitor Belfort and Don the Predator Fry. So why did he get the title shot instead of Severn? Well, as it turns out, six days prior to UFC 15 was the first Pride event. Tank was then slated to fight Kimo, but as it turned out, Tank Abbott had some law trouble that prevented him from traveling to Japan. So who stepped in but Dan Severn, and then what went down was one of the most boring fights in MMA history. Despite there being an inaction that plagued most of the fight, Severn ended up somehow, someway actually injuring himself, and as a result of this, he was unable to compete at UFC 15. So that's when Tank Abbott stepped in, and one of the most strangest title shots took place where Tank actually just quit in the middle of the match from exhaustion. I haven't been training, I've been partying. Yeah, that sounds about right. Number six, the fastest submission in UFC history. Sort of. Most of the time you hear about teammates fighting in MMA and it's either a story of a rivalry gone awry or the exact opposite where loyalties completely mean both fighters outright refuse to fight one another. In this case, it was neither. It was at UFC 6 and Oleg Taktarov was originally scheduled to face Pat Smith, who had won in the quarterfinals but was unable to continue due to injury. So the man to step up was one of Oleg's teammates, Anthony Macias, who won his alternate bout early in the evening to qualify. Nevertheless, Oleg seemed game and Macias didn't seem to be bothered either, so the match was on despite their teammate status. And oh hey, that's actually Michael Buffer. Many don't realize that he actually announced UFC events, this one and UFC 7. So everything seemed to be fine as soon as it started. But then Anthony Macias, who I should point out is not a grappler, but a Muay Thai fighter, an art known for brutal stand-up, immediately just ran up to Oleg, who is a Sambo grappler, which means he's great with submissions, and tried to take him down. So easily and naturally, Oleg immediately snagged him in a guillotine choke with barely any resistance at all, Anthony Macias tapped. The filling in the air was palpable as Oleg stared down Macias with a disgusted look on his face. All the while, the announcer said pretty much everything to imply what we had just witnessed was a fixed fight. All right, Jim, I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking the same thing. He just comes in there. The perfect position for the choke. You're not happy about it. Well, I wasn't really happy about the whole thing of friendship. 
From the looks of it, Oleg was not in on it and was actually angry about the situation, where Macias avoided eye contact with him and was quick to leave the cage as soon as he could. As a result, Oleg went on to the finals to face Tank Abbott, where he'd end up snagging him in a rear naked choke to win the UFC 6 tournament. There's a lot of theories about way more fixed fights out there. Of all the ones though, make no mistake, this is the most blatant in UFC history. Speaking of UFC history, it holds the record for the fastest submission ever at 9 seconds that still stands to this day. Number 5, the Phantom Belt. So part of the issue of having one night tournaments back in the first UFCs meant that the promoters of the event pretty much had to just rely on luck to get a huge match. And it wasn't just who won or lost either, for instance the two biggest stars of the UFC in the early days both competed in UFC 3, but both were injured before they could make it to the finals to get the rematch that everyone really went there to see from UFC 1. Ken Shamrock injured his knee in the semi-final fight against Felix, and since Hoist Gracie was unable to continue after his grueling match with Kimo, Ken Shamrock wasn't interested in competing in the final. He was pretty much there to fight Hoist again, which wasn't going to happen. Pretty disappointing considering the event poster even advertised the two fighting again, as they were clearly favorited to be the final two. So the promoters got tired of playing with luck and started outright just booking these big fights on their cards called Super Fights with a special belt to go along with it. And after nearly two years since the first UFC event where Shamrock lost to Hoist Gracie, we were finally going to get the rematch everyone wanted to see in the first super fight ever. Once and for all, we'd all know who the best martial art on the planet was, so it seemed. But as it turned out, luck was still a part of the equation and wasn't on the promoter or fan side. The bout ended up being a stalemate where Shamrock was intent not to take big risks and get submitted again, and Hoist just wasn't able to get his submission game going. And so this created a whole host of issues. The first being the fact that the UFC didn't know what to do if a fight went longer than 30 minutes, which was their time limit, and of course it did. So they just let the time kind of go on for a little while. Unsure of what to do next, they set five more minutes on the clock, but still no definitive winner. And since there were no judges in the UFC yet, because they never really needed it, everyone won by submission or a form of KO or TKO before then, they had no clue what to do. And with the pay-per-view already extended from two hours to three hours, and only 20 minutes left before that would expire, it was simply called a draw. And even more awkwardly so, the UFC created a special belt just for this event with UFC 5 even printed on it. So there was no winner. The belt was ironically created for no one in the end. On Fight Pass, the UFC has done a fascinating documentary short detailing what happened to the belt afterwards. But with a special belt made and personalized for a special occasion, it was made useless by this draw to the promoters moving forward. There was also another draw between Ken Shamrock and Oleg Tokhtarov at UFC 7 for another super fight, but Shamrock had already been awarded his belt at UFC 6 after beating Dan Severn, so luckily they didn't have another one created for that event. Number 4, Steve Jenham and the Two-Gloved Boxer As I mentioned a minute ago, UFC 3 was a bit of a disaster for them. Hoist Gracie beat Kimo but could not continue and Ken Shamrock won both both of his fights but injured his knee and was unwilling to fight since he just wanted to fight Hoist anyway. And there's an interesting note to be made about Shamrock's last fight of the night against Felix Lee Mitchell, who himself was a replacement for Keith Hackney when he injured himself beating Emmanuel Yarbrough early in the night. He was a kickboxer who, like the one-gloved fighter from UFC 1, Art Jimerson, wanted to protect his hands. But instead of wearing just one glove, he decided to wear both of his. The problem? Well, he just kind of showed up with them without telling anybody. If you're familiar with boxing controversies, you can see why this is so problematic. He definitely didn't have them cleared by Big John, so he was forced to remove them before fighting Ken Shamrock. Either way, Shamrock ended up winning, so three out of the four winners earlier in the evening were injured. This meant that there was no other semi-final fights, and the two that made it to the end was the lone man not to get injured that won earlier in the evening, Harold Howard, and the remaining alternate, Steve Jenham. And the alternates didn't have to fight to qualify in the tournament UFC 3, meaning this created the strangest scenario in which Steve Jenham was fighting for the tournament championship despite not having fought once earlier in the evening at all. He was totally fresh. Sure enough, he ended up beating Howard as the night bizarrely ended not with the super fight rematch between Ken Shamrock and Hoist Gracie, but a fresh alternate who didn't have to qualify beating Harold Howard 
whose only win of his career was earlier that night against Roland Payne. It was just a total disaster and if you're wondering why one night tournaments are not around today aside from the fact that you could never get past an athletic commission, look no further than this disaster of an event. Number 3. Hickson Gracie Everyone knows who Hoist Gracie is. He's the man who put the UFC and Jiu Jitsu on the map. He won his tournaments not with blunt force and bloody violence but technique and grappling like the world had never seen. But the Gracie family had much stronger fighters in their ranks, most notably Hoist's older brother Hickson who was considered the best in the world. So why didn't he fight in the UFC? In an interview with Jeff Wagenheim and Art Davey for Sports Illustrated, Art Davey detailed that there were tensions between Horian Gracie who represented the Gracie family and Hickson over control and money in the family. So it was Hoist that was ultimately chosen to fight instead of Hickson with the added benefit of being able to say somebody who is smaller like him could exemplify the effectiveness of Jiu Jitsu against bigger guys. But after UFC 3, Hoist was taken to his limits against Kimo and he was unable to continue on in the tournament. So moving forward, he essentially agreed to step down and let someone else from the family fight in his place. This is where Hickson was supposed to carry the family name forward at the next event, UFC 4. But that very quickly fell apart. Hickson demanded $1 million, and this is at a time when the winners were earning less than $100,000 for the whole event if they won. Needless to say, his demands were never met. He then went on to fight and win the following year in his second Valley Tudo Japan tournament, then at Pride 1 and pride for both against pro wrestler Nobuhiko Takada and then one last time against Funaki also in Japan. Unfortunately he never did fight the best in the world and we never got to see some of these legendary matchups of his day. Instead we got his comments about the guys who were champions moving forward. For instance he called Fedor a man of so-so ability and insisted that he would beat Brock Lesnar at the age of 50. Number 2 Melton Bowen versus the Miami Cannibal If you're looking for a crazy story look no further than this one. Tank Abbott is often credited to be the first man to wear gloves in the octagon, but that distinction actually belongs to Melton Bowen. Who the fuck is that guy? Great question. Well, he fought at UFC 4. His one and only fight was against Steve Jenham from UFC 3, who won the tournament under strange circumstances, as mentioned before. Unfortunately, it wasn't the best result for him as he lost to Steve Jenham by submission only five minutes into the fight. But he at least had the innovation of fingerless gloves, although he wasn't able to grapple successfully. At least he had that going for him. And aside from this, he was also a boxer that fought as late as 2005, although the majority of his fights were in the 90s and he amassed a 35-9 and boxing record, including a losing effort to Let's go champ! Let's go champ! Let's go champ! Shannon Briggs. He was Jamaican, but Bowen ended up living in Miami and that's where he came across the Miami Cannibal. The guy's real name is Rudy Eugene and in 2012 he made worldwide news for mauling and biting the face off of a homeless man while reportedly being high on bath salts that sent him into this crazy zombie like frenzy. Eugene was killed by a police officer after refusing to stop attacking the homeless man and he was killed on site by gunfire. The connection to Melton Bowen is that he actually knocked the guy out. The local Miami news station WSV and TV interviewed him about his knockout. It's a beyond strange thing to have happened, and it's unbelievable how small the world is at times. Number 1. Kimo's Cross Perhaps the most infamous of all UFC entrances goes to Kimo. Being a devout man of faith, he took the Bible verse in part saying, take up your cross and follow me, very literally. And the story behind it is quite odd. In the early days, the UFC was extremely concerned about being perceived in any way as professional wrestling. They wanted people to know that this was real and unscripted. That meant removing the more theatrical elements like extravagant ring entrances. But Kimo was determined to spread his message to the world no matter what, and didn't care how much it might have resembled pro wrestling antics. Of course, they weren't just going to let him do this, so Kimo came up with a plan to get around this by simply having it shipped to the arena marked as training equipment. And so this meant that during his entrance to fight Hoist Gracie, the UFC management along with everyone else in the crowd learned live on the broadcast what was in that box for the first time. As he walked out, the commentators immediately called it exactly what the promoters feared it would be perceived as. This was the uh, WWF segment of our evening tonight, it yeah. seems like. It. Ironically, the man with him, Joe Sun, also made his own special ring entrance with a cross when he fought at UFC 4. Unfortunately, he wasn't quite able to 
also hold up the cross successfully, like his friend who was six foot three, where Joe's son was just five four. The irony of this, of course, is that he was involved in a gang rape in 1990, and while in prison, was found guilty of murdering his cellmate, which landed him in prison for 27 years. So yeah, it's pretty ironic that he was pushing a faith-based message while he clearly wasn't practicing it. The bastard is just zero and four, and fittingly, in his fight with Keith Hackney, who was repeatedly struck to the balls. Thanks for watching my list, guys. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe and like. We upload at least three videos per week about MMA, and it really helps us out when you do so. If I missed anything on this vid, let me know in the comments, and feel free to follow me on Twitter, at JasonTheHeart, or follow the official channel account, at OnPointMMA. Thanks for watching so much, and I'll catch you on the next video. Three. Jurassic Park is the number one movie. The X-Files airs its first episode. Michael Jackson is the Super Bowl halftime performer. And while none of us were aware, Horry Gracie, along with Art Davey and SCG, headed by Bob Myrowitz, were planning what was then only to be thought as a one-time event happening on November 12, 1993. The ultimate